Welcome back to another episode of the Bird Factory Podcast. What is up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Burn Factory Podcast. I'm your host, Priest, joined by my co-host, my brother, the one and only Phoenix. Say what's up to the camera. What's up, y'all? This is called the Burn Factory for a reason. I was literally caught on fire. 50% chance to live, but through that, I started this podcast because I believe every person out there on this planet has a burn moment somewhere in their life. You heard Priest say a burn moment. So a burn moment is a super hard time in someone's life that they just had to fight to get through to be where they are today. And me and Priest believe that every single person go through burn moments every single day that truly build them to who they are. But Priest, what a guest we have today. I am so fired up for this episode. Our guest, he was selected number one overall in 2001 by the Atlanta Falcons. He's a four-time Pro Bowler. He won the Comeback Player of the Year Award. He was the first ever quarterback to rush for more than 1,000 yards in a season. He has a dec- documentary called The Champions and a book called Finally Free, a tell-all biography about his life, and recently was inducted into the National Quarterbacks Club Hall of Fame. So please give a welcome to Michael Vick. Let me, in. Let me say this. First of all, y'all got some cool names. <laughs> <laughs> Priest and Phoenix. Priest and Phoenix. Like, I have the better get- name. It, better name. Yeah, I got. I would say name. it's about even, but it's about cool even. names. Yeah, and in and, and, and your intro, it, it should have been a five-time Pro Bowl. I had a burn moment. We'll talk oh. about it. Okay, oh, okay, okay, okay. Five times, five times. But it was four time, but it should have been five. Should have been we'll five. Okay, but I got a little story to to kick things off. Um, so you know, growing up, my dad grew up in D.C. So he's a a big Redskins fan, uh, so, a diehard Redskins fans, which means I'm a Redskins fan too. Right, right. And so. He had season tickets, and at the time we lived in Colorado. So every year we would sit down, look at the schedule, and be like, okay, like what game do you guys want to go to? And so this was 2010. I was about seven years old, and he was like, um, they're playing the Eagles. They're hosting the Eagles, Monday night football game. Like, do you guys want to go? And I was like, yeah, of course. I want to go see Michael Vick play. I want to go see the Redskins play. Like, let's go. Let's go. So we take a flight all the way from, from Colorado to, to D.C. and it's November, so the weather isn't great. It's it's raining. It's freaking raining. cold and yeah. and everything. And you know I'm excited. I got my Sean Taylor jersey on, just like ready to go. In the very first play of the game, you throw an 82 yard <laughs> touchdown yeah. to Deshaun Jackson. Yeah. Really? You had to yeah. do me like that? Yeah. It was uh it, it was built up. First of all, shout out Deshaun Taylor. All right, Sean was was an amazing player. Uh, got it crazy story about him but I won't get into it but yeah that night was like um you know first off my grandmother was a a, a Redskins fan a Commanders fan Commanders um and you know my dream derived of playing in the NFL you know watching football through her and so I I told her if I ever made it I'd never lose to to Washington and so that was part of the motivation in that throw Hanging went out deep, and then Deshaun and Landry got into it before the game. So it was a little tension. There was a lot of tension. And and so, you know, as a competitor, when you see one of your boys getting into it with somebody else, you you want to get get back. Now, you can't get get back physically, so I was able to do it through the air. Especially <laughs> mentally, because we were just sitting here in the rain, and you're just like, are you kidding me? Yeah. yeah. And you then just, not only, you scored literally five more five <laughs> more touchdowns, and it was 45 to 14 and a half. No, that, that probably was my best game I ever had. In, in my career as far as, uh, you know, just being dialed in and, and comfort level. You think that's your best performance all time? Yeah. High school, college, um, NFL? You know, in the NFL, you get game plans, and throughout the week you you try to gain an understanding of what, what has to happen on each individual play versus numerous defenses. And, and it's some nights you just, you know, everything just happens. Like, you see it, you react to it, you make a good decision, you go on to the next play. and. That was, those, that was one of those nights where I, I felt like, um, you know, I was the best player in the league. And I had plenty of nights like that, but and you should, you know, as a, as a player who's striving to be the best. And, and so without, it was just one of those nights where I just, I felt really good, man. I, I didn't even feel that it was cold. I didn't even feel that it was raining. What'd you do, change up your pregame routine or something? Uh, nah. Um, what did I do? I, I took a long nap. Before the before the game, a long nap, unusual, and uh, 
I woke up and Donovan McNabb, who was a good friend of mine, had yeah. just signed a contract. They like gave him a contract like right before the game had started. Like 30 minutes before, you know, it was time to go to the stadium. And I was like, man, you know, I, I kind of looked at it as motivation. Um, not disrespect, but I kind of used it to my advantage to go out and just be even more motivated to show the Eagles that I was worthy of getting a new contract at some point. So I, it, it's, a lot of things happened, but the unusual nap probably was the reason I was super focused. Uh, a nap? I feel like if I took a long nap before a game, you know, you kind of feel a little sluggish. You yeah, feel nah, like I did you can't take, get going. Yeah, a couple years later, I was a little old. I took a nap against... I was, we was about to play Kansas City, and I took a nap before that game, and I came out sluggish. So I yeah. was, you know, I was 32 versus 34, and and it made a big difference. Speaking of pregame, what do you like do right when you wake up on a morning of an NFL game? Pray. Mm. Yes. Get up and Amen. pray. And get up and do. pray for for your health and safety because you know um, you about to you about to enter into a gauntlet where everybody's swinging at you, especially the quarterback. You got people falling. Around your legs, your ankles, you they, you know, you, a lot of high impact, um, very physical. Even though we're not as physical as other positions, um, when the defensive guy wakes up, all he's thinking about is sacking the quarterback, hurting him, getting him out the game. You know, they taught that to get the starting quarterback out the game, bringing the backup. It'll be a lot easier to to uh, to win the game if the backup's in. So. <laughs> A lot of anxiety, so I play. I pray for clarity, you know, mental clarity. Amen, amen. So you said you had anxiety before the game. Was that every single game you kind of had? Yeah, it? I mean, it was good anxiety. Um, uh, being afraid to fail, I think, was always like my motivation. Um, you know, especially if you got your wife, you got your family, you got your kids, you got your mom, you got people who you sit around just in normal conversations and tell, like, I'm the best. So you got to prove it to them. You got to. You got a fan base that um, is dependent on you and your performance, and, and you know you you dictate everything that this organization is going to be able to embody as far as success. Um, so, and and this just it all lies in the hands of the quarterback, and so I took that responsibility really serious and personal, and but had fun doing it. So I, I feel like the being afraid to fail like made me better. It, going back to praying, I feel like every every single time before I pray, so during golf tournaments, I'll be up on the first tee saying a little prayer. And before that, I'm like, I'm going to start oh. doing that, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Any, anyways, before I tee off, I'm like a little antsy and like nervous. And right when I pray, it's just <sighs> gone. And it's just like yeah. peaceful tunnel yeah. vision. And I'm going to tell you the one time I think I prayed before I teed off on a golf shot. Um <laughs> This we is was playing in a, we was playing in a golf tournament. I was playing in a golf tournament. Michael Strahan invited me to uh, like six, seven months ago, and this is the first time I teed off. In fr actually, the second or third, but this time it was a it was a crowd. Like it was a big crowd watching. It's almost like a PGA Tour tournament, and and Fred Couples was the captain of our team. And the only reason I said a prayer is because after all these years of putting in that hard work and time in golf, all I wanted to do was hit a good shot in front of Fred Couples. And how often do you get to have a, a professional golfer at an event, you know, a, a golf event that you plan? It's not just a random event. It was by design that he was the uh, the captain. And Man, I hit one straight down the fairway. Oh, oh, there you go. That's the best. All the years of hard work, it was like it paid off right there. Now the rest of the round was like, whatever. <laughs> whatever. But, it doesn't matter. Yeah, though. but I, I hit some good shots in front of Fred Couples, and I think I prayed about it. So <laughs> that's literally <laughs> the best. That's the best feeling though. Like, in, like for us in the tournament, like you're kind of anxious, and you're, but then you just stripe it, and you're just like, oh, yeah, thank God. Yeah, like we're yeah. good. We're good. I almost feel like I'm more focused on the first shot than I am on the next shot. Yeah, I'm I'm the type. I get better as the round go on. So, go, always going into that back nine is when I clean it up. I shoot 42 on the front and I shoot 37 on the back. Wow, oh, there you or go. Or I shoot 46 on the front and 40 on the back. We might have a little competition today. Uh oh, <laughs> he yeah, might definitely. be coming after us for that. <laughs> Strike it good. He might try to get that belt right there, but I don't know if that'll happen. Hey, I mean, you know, it's comp you like y'all like competition? Of oh, course. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah that, that's what it's all about. Also, we might have to do another belt for pool. <laughs> yeah. We were talking Bring about it that on, a little bit. Bring earlier. it on. Bring 2K. It 
Let's we run it. We do it. We'll run everything. Video man. games, pool. Maybe we can see yeah. if we can throw it as far yeah, as you. Give, give me your game attack. Give me your game attack. <laughs> Zillick yeah. got him, boy. <laughs> <laughs> this dude's name is Zillick got him, boy. I'll find him. I'll search it. Yeah, you'll find it. I'll search it and find them. <laughs> but all right, Mike. So on this podcast, we use the acronym Burn. So each letter is a little different time in your life. Okay. So we're gonna kick things off with B. B stands for beginning. So take us back to your childhood, high school days. Uh, were there any burn moments that you just really had to get through that really got you to where you are today? Um, yeah, man. I mean, I think uh, you know, just in the beginning. You know, like I say, through my grandmother, uh, I realized that I wanted to play professional football at some point in my life. Really, when I was seven, seven or eight years old, I, you know, it was, wasn't no Google. You couldn't, I mean, I was a kid, so I, but I found out that you get, you made money playing football, and I was like, okay, this is my path. And, and so, you know, I do all these great things, you know, in Little League, uh, get to high school, and, um, you know, having a great high school career, freshman year, sophomore year, and then uh, my junior year, my grades dropped significantly. I'm being recruited by all the uh, schools across the country. And then, you know, I just had a mental lapse in grades and other things became important. And, and then so I di almost di didn't make it. And that was like my burn moment. Like my high school coach stopped talking to me for a year. It was like eight months. He, he, uh, he was just like, look, if, you're not gonna be like everybody else. You're not gonna be a statistic. You got a lot of opportunity in your life to make some of your life, and I got to turn my back on you. And it was it was all my fault, and I knew it was because I just got caught up in everything else outside of being a, a better student. And I, so I had to buckle down for a year, man, get my grades up and get everything right. And so that, you know, when I think about um, times in my life where I put everything at stake in, in, in jeopardy, Everything, I, all I ever wanted was a scholarship, uh, full scholarship, full ride, and that was my moment, and I almost blew it right then and there, but thank God I had him in my life who um, you know, really put his foot down and made me you know, focus. It, it shows you that he was really looking out for you because yeah. if he didn't see nothing in you, he probably wouldn't turn your, his back on you. Yeah, and I, I look back on it like, man, he really cared. Mm -hmm. You know, he really cared. Me and my wife talk about it all the time, like, the routine and the regimen he had us on um, kept us out of trouble, kept us in a position where we could, you know, have a little job, make a little money, stay focused, and, and really understand what priorities and responsibilities was really all about. So it was cool. Do you still keep up with him today? Obviously? Yeah, he called me this morning. He called yeah. me and hung up. I don't know why he hung <laughs> up soon as he called me, but I think that's a sign when you want somebody to call you back, but you don't want to bother him. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, he's never he's never bothering me. That's so cool. What age did you meet him at? Um, I met him at the age of 14. So if you're familiar with Aaron Brooks, um, yeah. played, played quarterback the NFL, with the Saints. Yeah, yeah my yeah. second cousin. Uh, he coached Aaron first, and then I came after Aaron. And so we uh, we met when I was 14. Aaron invited me up to junior varsity practice. I was going to play one more year of Little League. I was going to try to squeeze it out. And uh, it, it just was time to move on, and, and I met him, and... You know, two days he made me the starting quarterback. He seen the arm talent, and uh, you know, hopefully it was you know my character showed amongst you know the rest of the the young men I was around, and and uh, he made me the starter at, at junior varsity at 14 years old. Wow, that's crazy. And then I played varsity at the end of the year, and that was you know really scary, but it was it was good experience. Heard of the big Great boys. Experience. <laughs> Great experience. So, well, I was about no, to say so so after your your sophomore year, I believe you had to switch schools, correct? And he followed you there, Correct. right? Yeah, I follow him. Or he followed, okay, you follow yeah, him. Yeah, I follow man. him. We were supposed to go to a, a brand new school that was opening up. It was, they opened up two amazing schools, and you know, we thought we was going at the in the final hour. They he, they switched the school, and he had to go to another school. And it was a rival school where we was playing against guys that we knew and was good friends of ours, just in a different location, different part of the city. And they merged us all together. And it was the weirdest thing because the quarterback from that school was one of my best friends or good friends. And they had to move him to tight end. You know, I mean, it was only right. But my coach coming over, it was like, it felt biased. It felt real biased. Like we just came and just like, but they was like two and eight the year before. And we, 
we ended up like six and four. So we made them better, <laughs> significantly better. How hard was it to transfer though before your senior year? It was different. You know, it, it's one of those things in high school, you just never know what's going to happen. Like, you would never think that you would have to transfer out of your high school that you're at now and, and go to a different school like abruptly. You know, it's, it's a cool experience, but at the same time, I would have rather went to the new school. I think it was something personal against my high school coach, I think. You know, when I think about it, but, you know, it's hindsight. And uh, we made the most of it. We made the most of it. But Did it was really it? weird. What do you really, mean it was really it, weird? It was just because we knew all the we knew all the guys that was over there. Like we we played against them two years in a row, and so the first school I went to was Ferguson, and and it was Warwick, and we it was like a rival. It's almost like um, Dallas versus New York, the Giants, or yeah. Dallas versus Philly, and then you just get the whole Dallas team just go and merge with Philly, you know. So it was weird. <laughs> right when you transferred, did your friends like? Did they ever get like mad at you and like have beef with you since you transferred? Like in that very moment? Nah, they they was cool. Um, you know, everybody really kind of had attitude about it, was upset about it, but they understood the situation. Like our school closed down just out of you know, it's just like out of nowhere. And uh, we we knew it was coming, but we all like I said, we knew we thought we was going to the new school that they had just built. They had just built this amazing high school, and. Um, like I say, in, in in the 23rd hour, man, they 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 switched the whole game plan on us, and we had, we end up having to go to merge with a school where, I mean, you, you know, things like that happen, and then there's just potential for a lot of bad things to happen. You know, you got, you know, it's envy. You know, guys want your position. You, know, you, it was just a lot, and and so I took it with a grain of salt. I just, um, you know, my high school coach came and. You know, all the, obviously, all the kids that he knew was better than the kids that was there. He put a he put us in the position to make the school better, which was the most important thing. Did you feel like you had to prove yourself though? As soon as you got there, yeah. Every year, I felt like I had to prove myself. Every year, um, it was a guy named Ronald Curry. He was a crosstown rival, and uh, he got all the accolades. He was like the best quarterback I ever seen in high school. Like, I mean, regardless of who you seen out there, Ronald Curry was the best high school quarterback <laughs> ever. And um, so I was always motivated to do just as well as him and, you know, try to get a small, you know, snippet of, um, you know, newspaper clipping next to his. His would be like this big and mine would be like that. And and so I had, I played the underdog role for a long time. And I just, you know, I just felt like when I went to college, I get the same players type, but good players around me. I have equal opportunity as as everybody else had. Um, we wasn't the best. I didn't have the best players around me. I wasn't the best, you know, either. If when I look at myself and Ronald, um, he was a lot more talented than me. He was bigger. He was a little stronger. And once I got to college and I got, you know, I got a, a, a heavy diet at the weight room and, you know, I was able to gain 20 pounds and be around some players that was just as good as me. My true skill set was able to show. Speaking of college, what, year in high school did you commit to Virginia Tech? Uh, I committed my senior year. Uh, I got the the offer. Um, I, I had offers from uh, Syracuse, Georgia Tech, Clemson, East Carolina, and Virginia Tech was like my top five. And so I visited East Carolina, um, visited Syracuse. It was a uh, 15 inches of snow on the ground. It was cold. Donovan McNabb was my host. It was really cool. Great experience. I just got sick, caught the flu, and I, I knew Syracuse oh. was instantly out. It was instantly out. <laughs> He's like, I got sick. No, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, no, they see, you know, Donovan. I called him like two days later, like, bro, I'm down. And um, so they knew that was out, but it did come down to Syracuse, Virginia Tech. And so I made that, I made the commitment my senior year. What was that like in that very moment whenever you signed that? Um, I knew uh, I was one step closer to my dream. Most importantly, I'm like, all right, mission accomplished. Pop Warner was cool. High school complete. This is one more the yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, off to college. And, and so, you know, now it, uh, just a new level of anxiety started to creep in again. It's like as soon as I, you know, passed one test, it was like a, another one being put in front of me. But, you know, that was that was part of the process. 
So you find you get to college and then they redshirt you. How did you feel about being redshirted? Were you fine with it? Or were you like, yeah, man, I, I just want to play? Yeah, I was thankful to be redshirted. Um, what I found out when I went to college is that I didn't know enough about football. Uh, it was a different level of understanding. You, you have to learn defenses before you can even learn your offense and know what to do. And so when I first got there, my football knowledge was just like on zero. Like, um, so it took like four months to learn how to read defenses. And um, so I couldn't play my first year because I, I would have been a mess. Like my first 30 practices, after those first 30 practices, I was like, Ma, I think I'm gonna come home and get a regular job. Really? Yeah, football is way too hard. What was that burn moment that made you wanna stick with football? Um, that moment didn't come until uh, later in the year. Like I said, it took like two or three months to learn how to read defenses, maybe like four. And so this was a good burn moment though. Um, I'm coming to the meetings every day. My coach, you know, he encouraging me to continue to come to the meetings, keep coming. Uh, I think I told my wife this story plenty of times. And be like, keep coming, keep coming to the meetings. And so, like, man, I'm wasting time. You know, my all my all my boys, all the freshmen who came in with me, they hanging out at, all during the weekends and they're going home and seeing their families and I'm traveling with the team and really not understanding what's going on, whether we in game or whether we in a practice session or in a film session. And so it's like late December, I'm sitting in the film and when I'm watching watching the film and, and all of a sudden it just came together. It was like, okay, I'm looking at a cover two defense and I'm like seeing how people move and I'm looking at a single a cover three defense and I'm seeing how people move and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna go out on the scout team today and, and, and see if, you know, if it rings true, like what I'm doing, what I'm seeing. And the scout team, your job is to make the, you know, the number one defense better, number one offense better. And so you're just getting just free practice and so it all came, it all rang true. Like everything I seen, it just came all, it all came together. I won scout team player of the week, two weeks in a row. And then I learned more about defenses over the next two months. I learned our offense in two months. I was in a quarterback battle in the spring and, and I won, I emerged as the number one quarterback uh, after two weeks in, in a battle with a junior. Shout out to Dave Meyer, Dave, I love you, but it was great competition. <laughs> you just had to prove that. Yeah, yeah. So that was a good burn moment. That is a good burn moment. But you you almost quit. That's that's crazy. I was ready to quit three months before that. I was I was ready to pack it in. That was a burn moment because I, I just I realized I, I didn't understand enough about football. Uh and then the game was moving real fast. So you're gonna go from high school to college. It's just a different level. Guys are bigger, they're stronger. A little bit older, you know, like you, you're getting your grown man body. And so I was still 18 years old and trying to figure it out. And it was just, it was overwhelming mm. for sure. How did you like focus in? Because obviously college, there's so many distractions around you. How did you just like focus in on, on football? Yeah, well, one, I had a great offensive coordinator who was not only a good coach, he was like a father figure. So he was always checking in on, on me I, and, and, you know, my progress and school um, well-being, he, he was always concerned. And so I, I felt obligated to, you know, I always wanted to make my coaches proud w in whatever way I could. Like, I, I never wanted them to come to me and, you know, well, you're not doing well in school. You you know, you're missing class. And I'm like, I, I don't need the nagging. And, and so I always tried to make them proud, whether on the field or off the field. And so he was always checking up on me, but Still, throughout it all, in the back of my mind, I, I wanted to make it to the NFL. And, and, you know, at that time, it's like, it don't matter if I'm a first round pick or if I'm a sixth round pick, I just want a shot. And so I never thought I would be a, a number one pick. That was never a thought. If you would have asked me that at that moment, I'd be like, there's no way in life. And so, you know, that was all in God's plan. I'll say that. But at, at the end of the day, it was all about, getting drafted at some point, you know, doing everything right to get drafted at some point. So that was always the motivation at any point, you know, whether it was my first game or last game, 
you know, the focus in between was to, to to be good enough to be recognized and get drafted. Going to your first college football game, what what was that like? I realized I was in the setting, like I was just looking at the whole atmosphere, like this is what I watched on TV as a kid growing up, and this is the setting where these guys can go to the pros. Like I'm like, yo, this is this is next level. It's a different atmosphere, but and thank God I was able to raise her because I was able to just sit back and watch everything and be real observant. You know, um, it, because if I can became a starter one day, I want to know how to handle it. So it was important to watch our senior quarterback Al Clark at the time. Shout out to Al. Um, it was important to be able to watch him, how he handled things, how he handled timeout situations, how he handled uh, third down situations, how he handled first and ten, how he handled third and long, and decision making so I tried to you know learn vicariously the best I could so that red shirt definitely oh man helped well my high school coach he demanded that I didn't play really oh. yeah he he demanded that I didn't play from from you know I wouldn't say you know he he asked coach Beamer you know to not play don't don't play Mike his first year he knew I needed to learn the game so that was him covering up for me behind closed doors, and and Coach Beamer respected it because it was times they could have took they could have just put me in the game. Mike, you super talented, you can run. Um, might not have understood where to throw it, but I'd have been there to run. But you still no good if you can't if you can't do it. You know, compartmentalize and do it all it together. For sure, for sure. Even I was actually watching that game, your very first college game in the first play. You threw a pass and you said it was the worst pass you could ever throw. Yeah. The next play, you took it to the house. Yeah, and you're yeah. like, yeah, you know, I belong that, here. You watched, you seen that? <laughs> yep, of course. Yeah, that was, uh, well, in that moment, I just remember um, running onto the field, that first play, and looking into the sky. Like, I was so nervous. Like, I can't I can't explain. Like, a backup quarterback, who I, Dave Meyer, who I was in the, a battle with, we, we was roommates. and. I just remember being so nervous that night, and he was just like, "Mike, you're gonna do fine. Don't worry, you're gonna do fine. You just do what you've been doing in practice." And I'm like, "Nah, Dave, that ain't the case. Like, it's gonna be different out there. Like, you know what it's like. I don't know." And I remember just running on the field and looking in the sky and saying, "You know, to myself, God, if this is it, if this is what you want, like, th no, I was saying to myself, this is what I always wanted." So first play, I, coach, give me a pass play. <laughs> <laughs> Why wouldn't he let me hand it off on yeah. play one? Give, Give me a pass way. play. Yeah, I, I, I made the, I made a good read. I just threw the ball in the dirt. A little nervous, threw it in the dirt. I was like, all right, got that one out of the way. The next play, he calmed me down. He called a quarterback draw. And you house was, call. the rest was history. <laughs> like house call, like like house call on the second play of my career. It was like, I was like, damn, did they just let me do that? Like, is this game rigged or something? <laughs> Were you just flowing the rest of the game though? Like yeah, it was it, clicking after that? Um, yeah, it was almost like this is a tip I give to um, you know, just a lot of kids and a lot of people just watching. Um, you know, you gotta practice. Practice gotta be harder than the game. So I felt like our practice was like uh it was it was tough. It was tough. We had hard practices and and to get through those practices you got to be mentally tough and and so the game was just relatively easy because everything just slowed down in the game. I mean, I know this might sound crazy. I just said the game was fast, but everything slows down in the game um, when you when you know what you're doing, when you understand. And I know that might sound crazy, but I was just so comfortable. It was like I couldn't miss. I had good players around me. My offensive line blocked. My receivers caught the ball. Running backs ran. All I had to do was my job, manage the game. You know, and and so until I did that flip in the end zone on the touchdown run, <laughs> um, I was probably statistically, I'm um, having my, the best game of of my career, and that was its first game, and but that was you know, best game of my life, and so I was just really comfortable. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to the end of the season, you guys are playing in the national championship yeah, against Florida State. How crazy was that moment? That that was crazy. Never thought we would. Uh, never thought that you would make it to a national championship, especially after you know 13 months prior being ready to quit football and 
and then learning it, then going through a quarterback battle, um, going through spring training, still building my fo football intellect, and then starting from the first game, being nervous, throwing the ball in the dirt, um, to winning 13 games in a row, um, getting hurt, coming back from injury, playing the whole season, um, basically on a bad ankle, um, but just being able to persevere through that, wanting the, the hunger, wanting still in the back of my mind, like uh, if I continue to do this right and get better and better, I'm gonna have a shot at playing in the NFL. So it was just all these factors and variables, and then all of a sudden it's a national championship. So when we get to that game, it's like I felt like I did a lot, I did enough, um, not to play on the next level, but to showcase that it was one of the best teams in the country, and that I was probably one of the best players in college football. Never thought it would be that way. I just the grind, the grind mm -hmm. got me to that point. You just kind of just kept your head down and kept going. Yeah, it was like, if we beat Rutgers, we can enjoy it for the night, but that's not good enough. We got we got Miami next week. Got to get ready for Miami. Beat Miami, y'all. We got West Virginia. So it was really no time to, um, it was really no time to celebrate. You know, you couldn't celebrate. You could celebrate with your family or celebrate for a couple of hours, but if you go out and lose the next week, then it's, it changes the dynamic of everything. And so we always wanted to just stay, you know, ascending. Going back to the championship game, were you more nervous for that game than you were for your first college game? Yeah, I was more nervous for that national championship game than anything I probably ever did in my life. And I went to the Heisman Trophy ceremony the week, the, the week before, had to speak in front of, you know, millions of people, conquered that. And then that game, like I, it was just the magnitude of it. It was, it was, um, it was just exciting. And I just, I remember the first, the first drive. I couldn't, I couldn't. It was so loud. I couldn't bark out the cadence loud enough. I couldn't. I had a headache. Um, my head was pounding. And then the second quarter, I just settled down, and I just, I got into a rhythm. And they was up by that time. It was, it was like twenty-eight to seven or something. And when it clicked for us, we was like we had to, we had to fight and get back into it. And then we end up taking the lead 28, 29, 28, and then they ran off with it. But just to be in that moment and and to make it, man, it was like we we never thought we would be in that moment. So for every man on that roster, coaches included, um, it, it was a great it was it was a great run and a good success story. Yeah, so for me, like in golf, sometimes like I'm playing in a big golf tournament and I kind of feel that pressure. Sometimes I don't know how to like handle it as well. So what would you say, like how would you handle a high pressure situation kind of like that? Like what were some things um, that you did just in think, that game? Um, think positive. Think positive. Like more so than uh, knowing that, like, because if you practice and put in the time, you know you can pull off a shot. I know I can pull off a throw. I know if... Uh, you know, something happened and it's outside of the box that I can react to it and and, and I can be, you know, present in the moment. And and, and you know, you know it's gonna be some moments where you're gonna have to persevere. You might you might duck hook the first shot. <laughs> yeah. But in, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Like I I had games where uh nothing went right for three quarters. I had a game I threw four interceptions and then had a game when I had a game winning drive, I had a minute and, and like 52 seconds left on the four yard line. We had to go 96 yards after throwing four interceptions. And so you can imagine how I felt. Yeah. Uh, my cousin called me right after the game, was like, man, great finish, but you got to tighten it up. Uh, yeah, obviously. But it's not always going to go right. And so when you go into it, knowing that, look, it, I don't have to be perfect. I just got to persevere. And you're going to come out on top every time. For yeah. sure. Be ready for the adversity. This portion of the Burn Factory podcast is sponsored by Phoenix Salon Suites. Please visit Phoenix Salon Suites at P-H-E-N-I-X Salons, S-A-L-O-N, Suites, S-U-I-T-E-S dot -E com to find one near you. Right into our next topic and Burn, you unfortunate i actually want to share a little unfortunate experience myself yeah, you got it so it's last week of school we just moved into this house right on the golf course as you can see 
my dad just bought me a brand new set of golf clubs and I was actually about ready to play my very first golf tournament. Yeah. So pumped. Go to school. Normal day. Science class comes. Walk into the science class. Teacher says she's going to do a science experiment. And I didn't think too much of it. And she's like, yeah, it's going to be involved in fire, baking soda. Saying I'm like, oh, cool, fire. Like, yeah. It's going to be fun, like, watching something, like, burn and stuff. And yeah. So she's like, all right, we got to go outside to do this. And so we all get outside, semicircle, and next thing you know, it's like a bomb goes off. And then that moment, (laughs) I literally thought I was going to die. I remember <laughs> all the kids saying he's on fire, he's on fire. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> ambulance comes. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I feel like this. I, I, Ambulance comes. They put me in the ambulance, and the swelling was getting so bad. They're about ready to fly me to the hospital because they were worried I was going to make it. (laughs) And the swelling just started getting so bad. And I remember looking at my phone, Snapchat, and. My face was completely disfigured. <laughs> I was completely disfigured. And, and I thought I was going to look like that for the rest of my life. <laughs> Not knowing if people were going to look, look at me the same. <laughs> Am I ever going to get a girlfriend? Are people even going to look at me the same? Um, but <laughs> but in that tough time, I really found out how strong I was. <laughs> A couple days go by, and I had my day again, buddy. <laughs> Jeez. Very good. I had my dad go get my putter and I put a couple balls into this this little glass jar and slowly but surely it just started putting a smile on my face (laughs) in that moment I knew I was gonna fight And I won. I feel like just unfortunate times, that's such an unfortunate event like in our life and and for me I was literally it was summertime and I just got out of school and I was golfing with my buddies here and I'll never forget that like call like my dad called me and I was like oh, okay he's probably just calling like saying like like where are you when are you going to be home kind of thing and um he was like no your brother got burned and I was like oh okay maybe he was just messing with a hot glue gun or something but he was like no they're they might flight for life him and I was like, wow. 
And then just going to the hospital and just and seeing, like, that's my brother. Like, he's 12 years old. Like, why him? Like, yeah. we have such a grounded faith in our family. We went to a Christian school. But not going to lie, it was hard. It was like, God, like, why did this happen to him? Like, he's he's so pure. He's so, like, he's a child, man. And there's, there's people out there in this world that do so many horrific things that can't even compare to what he just just went through That's but right. at the end of the day now looking back on it three years like look look what we have now we're, we're sitting here talking to you we're yep. we're sharing our stories and, and for the people listening like they're going through some stuff too yeah. like not everyone's perfect not everyone lives this perfect life like they go through burn moments that a lot of people don't know about and we feel like that's really what makes you you. It's not the money. It's not the fame. It's not the followers. It's those hard times that you wanted to quit. Yeah. You were ready. You wanted to mail it in. But you're like, you know what? No. Like, those, I'm those here for a come. better purpose. Those so come. unfortunate things, unfortunate burn moments happen. And, and with your story, there's been so many unfortunate burn moments that you've had to just fight to get through. So... Could you share with us maybe some some unfortunate burn moments you went through? Um, well, I just talk about one, um, you know, having uh, having to go to prison, you know, for 18 months, having to leave my family, um, having everything that I always worked for in my life, um, put it in jeopardy. Um, not really understanding the magnitude of what I was going through. And so, um, you know, it was a burn moment where I jeopardized everything, everything in my life, you know, at the time. And, and so, you know, for whatever reasons, you know, it was another moment where I had to persevere. We got to persevere. You know, um, plenty of nights I cried. My wife would tell you, it's plenty of nights I cried on the phone and just having my freedom taken away. Just wanting to have a chance to live life again. Um, but knowing that it wasn't going to happen for two years. Like, I come from that type of background, but that's not my background. And so, you know, the things that I always told myself I wouldn't do, or places I went ended up, end up, I ended up. And so I can relate on so many levels to you know to tragedy. Um, so you know that was a that was a serious burn moment. And and for you, man, I understand. You know the pain. You know, but look how you fought. And it won't be hard to get a girlfriend now. You look good. You look good, man. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Thank you, yeah. hey, Thank you're good. You. You're a lucky man. Thank you. Lucky young man. Both of y'all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Super blessed. It puts a lot of things in perspective, too. It's like things can be taken like that. Yeah. And so, like that saying, like like live every day like it's your last. Yep. Like, no, I you feel like have to. Yeah. I feel you like now, to. like us, we truly live that like yeah. it's our last. Yeah, man. You um. You mentioned golf and golf, you know, being you know one of the um reasons why you know um. You know, the feeling of faith came back, you know, the joy, the happiness. You know, people ask me why I play golf, and it's, it's for those reasons. Like, the peace, the solitude, the, you know, I get to get all these memories, all these things that's jogged in my mind, out, out of my mind. You know, it's, it's uh, like I said, it's peaceful, and um, it's challenging. So you get all these emotion, emotional um, aspects of life on the golf course, and people don't don't know. Even if you you make a putt, you miss a putt. That's an emotional swing. Make a good swing, miss it, miss one. It's an emotional swing. You see your buddies hit a good shot, you compliment him. You, you turn your level of competition up. You know it's um it's amazing what sports can do for you. You know it's, it's amazing what settings like this can do for you. Um, you know. Getting it out and talking about it, man, it's always gonna be therapeutic for you. Being able to talk about, you know, my burn moments is really therapeutic for me because I don't get to ask the questions all the time. I just gotta live with it. And so, you know, I live with a lot of hurt. You know, I live with a lot of regret. You know, so 
You know, we all got something. And you never know what else is going to be. You just got to be ready for it. For mm-hmm. sure. Like how you said, you got to treat every day like it's your last. And yeah. even going back to when that unfortunate thing happened, what what was that thing that brought joy to you? In that, My um, family. Yeah, my family. I'm um, talking... I only had like two minutes a day to talk to to my wife and and try to find figure out what was going on in life or what was going on in the outside world, whether it was business related, whether it was related to my case, whether it was about my kids. I had three minutes a day to talk to the person I love the most. Um, my mom, some days I couldn't talk to her. I didn't have enough minutes on the phone where I could talk to her, you know? So, you know, I'm like, really like, to me, living in hell. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it could always be worse. I still, you know, I felt like as long as I woke up every day and I could breathe fresh air, I, like I got a chance, I'm one step closer. But man, I just, I just told myself I'd never take my freedom for granted. Waking up every day, like I say, is is a blessing. People, I don't think people uh, really put true value in in um, what it takes to have have your freedom and have uh, opportunity every day. So, um, you know, hopefully that's something that people gravitate to when they watch this this segment. Mm-hmm. For sure. For you sure. said um, your last day in prison was the start of your new life. Absolutely. So would you consider that last day like a burn moment? Like, you know what, I'm never going back to this. Like, it's only up from here. Yeah, you know, I wanted to burn all those memories, but I wanted them to stick. Like, I wanted them to... Uh, I wanted to feel those those 548 days for the for the rest of my life to some capacity. Like I know somewhere, you know, it, just in, in my spiritual being, it's like I always think about um, those moments and um, those days, how hard it was, and, and just try to put some perspective on my life when I wake up every day, when I can wake up and be with my family, and I can wake up and I got opportunities to do different things and explore different things and. Even even play golf or teach my son to play golf, or you know, have a chance to conversate with my son and my daughters about, um, you know, things that they may be going through, good or bad. How was their day in school? Um, you know, enlightenment. It really means a lot. So, just to, if I can live every day and have that and see them happy, I'm happy. They happy. Mm-hmm. You know, we all happy. That first day, getting out of prison. What what you what did you do? Damn, what we do? What do we do, <laughs> man? Um, I think I, I don't know. I, I think we went and got some fast food for sure. We went and got <laughs> some fast food. I think I re, I remember being in the hotel and just um, you know, just being in the certain place for so so long, um, being programmed to the same routine every day. It's like uh, you just you forget that it's a world out there that exists. I mean, I know it's ironic. I'm coming from a place where a lot of people who, majority of the people watching this probably never been, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, I like I say, I, I'm always um, appreciate the value of, of life, you know, waking up every day and having the chance to, like I say, have opportunity, waking, having the chance to um, be around the people that I love um, because I was around, you know, a bunch of people that I didn't know every day. and. Um, I just I never forget those I never forget those times. So I I remember, I, but I've totally forgot about what was out. You know what McDonald's looked like, what you know a hotel room looked like, yeah. like what it was like to go sit in a restaurant. I just became you know it became something that was just distant in my mind. Mm-hmm. Sure. How'd you how'd you deal with like all the haters out there and just. Whenever you like walked into, I actually saw where you walked into a steak restaurant and everyone was actually cheering and <laughs> happy you're there. Yeah. And then you look at like going to like the, whenever the Eagles did pick you up, you go to the facility and then you see protesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Protesting. It's like um, you got to have thick skin. Um, yeah, I learned that playing quarterback. Like, you know, just from years of, you know, doing well, you get the praise. And then when it's not going so good, you get the booze. And those boos hurt a lot more than those, you know, a lot more than um, the gratification you get out of the, the cheering, for sure. So, you know, it, it hurts your ego, it hurts your pride. And then 
So me in the situation I was in, I just had to look at it like, okay, I, you know, it's something that, I, you know, I, it's unjustifiable, um, and you know, I, I'm in a situation where I can only make amends and try to make it right. I can only do better, you know. Um, you know, perception is everything. You know, the world, ninety percent perception, ten percent reality. So people are gonna believe what they hear, and so it was my job to like try to make you know. Um, uh, you know, 80% of those haters or non-believers, believers, like, okay, he made a mistake. We forgive him. Mm -hmm. So I, I couldn't take it personal. I said all that to say that I couldn't take it personal. Yeah, because if you did, then yeah, it would now, really now, I'm, now I'm, Yeah, it was irrational thinking from there. The minute I get a chance to talk at the podium and I just went and threw for 300 yards and I could lash out, but that that's not going to, you know, it's not going to do anything for anybody. Um, it's not going to help my situation moving forward. It's not going to make people look at me any different. That's football. So I, I had to change as a person and I had to let people see that. I think, well, from the start, you, you've you always been out about it and speaking about it. And a lot of times it's hard. Like for him, it was hard to just speak about it now. Yeah. So how hard was it for you to, you know what, like I'm going to speak about it. I'm not just going to hide this away and pretend yeah. to forget about it. Yeah, I, I felt like um, my passion for animals, I really couldn't, you know, it, it it conflicted with my passion for animals. And so, you know, now people, you know, they looking at it like, damn, you did this, you went through this situation. And I'm like, man, only thing I could do is, is talk about it, um, become an advocate, um, embrace animal welfare, learn more about it, be more educational um, with it, and, and try to help the next generation help kids understand how valuable it, it is. And, and so I come from a place where we don't, you know, that don't take precedent or we don't, you know, add any value. To, we don't put value into it. We don't talk about it. Um, we don't learn it growing up. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I went through a situation where I had to learn a lot in terms of um, other things and other areas in life that I didn't, didn't pay a lot of attention to. And so, um, you know, why I'm thinking I'm not doing anything wrong. People look at it a certain type, a certain way. They look at it different. They view it different. And so I had to respect that part of it and, and, and uh, you know, try to be, you know, um, as contrite as I could be, you know, going through the process, even though I, you know, I wanted to be upset, be angry, wanted to explain myself, but it's no explaining, you know, in mm -hmm. the moment like that. You know, it's about um, just doing what's right. What did you kind of learn about yourself? During that time, you said you learned a lot about the other stuff, but what did you learn about you? Man, I learned that, uh, man, I can get through anything. You know, I, I learned that I can. It's no test on on the football field that I couldn't conquer. It's no test in life that I couldn't conquer after um, going to a place and going through what I went through. I won't explain, you know, um, you know, the day to day life, you know. But, you know, what it's like to be, you know, incarcerated or be away or, you know, how you um, get transported or how you move around, it's irrelevant. I, I had to experience that and, and you know, it hurt. it hurt. It hurt to go through it. But after going through it, I'm like, you know, it don't make me more of a man than anybody else. It's just that, you know, I had, I dealt with somebody, I, I felt like I had God on my side. And when I came out of it, I had more faith Mm. moving forward in life than I had fear. I can 1,000% definitely relate to that. Okay. And yeah. And right after my incident happened, it made me look at like, yeah. Faith, faith. faith, faith over fear. Mm -hmm. And even still to this day, I mean, through like the traumatic experience, I still fear of like things that could happen. Yeah. But through that toughest time, it really makes you a stronger person right, right. who you are today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's no really, I mean, it's no substitute for for trauma. You know, it, it, it comes in different forms and different things happen to different people. Um, you know, you, you you know, have some people who go through things and and, and they, don't even, they can't come back from it. You mm -hmm. know, people lose arms and legs and they... And they feel sorry for themselves, and then you never, you know, you hear how all these inspirational stories and and stories of people, you know, persevering and like 
man. I'm not gonna care what other people think. I'm not gonna care what anybody else say. You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm always walking my head hell high. Mm-hmm. And man, that that when you can do that, and when you can be that person, you know, on a day to day basis, there's nothing nobody can tell you. You dictate your life. You dictate where you want to go, what you want to do, and how successful you want to be. Nobody else can dictate that for you. Exactly. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love it. Yeah, for sure. But we're gonna move on to our a little a little more light than <laughs> you for unfortunate. Yeah, so life is an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> life that is don't a mean we can't be emotional right here. Yeah. This yeah, that's that's sure. what this podcast is. It's yeah. life. And uh so art is is ridiculous. So all those years in, in the NFL, college, high school, all those road trips. Um, there had to be a ridiculous like burn moment that you went through, whether it be, you know, a fan asked you a, a question, you know, you maybe had a stalker, you, it was there <laughs> any, oh. any ridiculous things that you had to, to go through that you could share with us? Um, any ridiculous things that I had to go through. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I know we just, we trying to, you know, bring the positivity. I mean, not positivity, but we trying to, you know, bring the energy back <laughs> up in here. But man, um, it was really weird. And I just, you know, I, I, maybe I just use this to clear up um, some of the things that happened in my career. Ridiculous moment. Um, and, and my wife, who's sitting right here, you know, sitting to my right, <laughs> your left. Um, she know the story. I was, we just played the, New Orleans Saints. Sean Payton just became the coach. Um, we had beat the Saints for years. My cousin Aaron Brooks was there. And um, so this particular year, Drew Brees come in, and Sean Payton, and they beat us on the road. And we was beating them at home, and and uh, we was beating them, and, and they came back and won. They had Drew. I did everything. I passed 180, threw for, ran for 180, threw for 180. And after the game, you know, I'm hearing these bulls. We lost. I'm hearing these bulls, and I'm like, I'm running into the locker room, and I look up in the stands, and it was like this New Orleans Saints fan, not Atlanta Falcons fan, because people think it was a Saints fan. It was born, and they were saying, you know, you know, I, saying all these things to me, and I'm like, you know, only thing I could react and do in that moment was put up my middle finger. I couldn't get to him. <laughs> I just like, I, like I just, I mean, it was like the man. I flicked them off, and I was like. You know, just kind of like mouthy behind it, and you know, I was having a moment, man. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I was saying earlier, I could have been five time Pro Bowl. It was four time, but that was like a ridiculous moment where I was getting heckled bad by a fan. Like I, you, I can't even repeat on camera what the fan was saying. And I'm like, nah, that ain't me. You got me. You talking about the wrong person. <laughs> and so I defended myself, and man, that that, that started my my downward spiral. Spiral and and I was uh you know it cost me a Pro Bowl man but I I it was a ridiculous moment that I could have handled a lot better I was 25 years old you know defending myself and then I just felt like um uh, how did a New Orleans Saints fan get in the middle of all these Atlanta Falcons fans and was able to talk trash to me I'm like yo y'all should have <laughs> yeah. y'all should have that up in the stands shouldn't have been me so. <laughs> Wait, yeah. so you ridiculous. Said, you said it, cro- it cost you a Pro Bowl? Yeah, I mean, I was on. I was having one of my best years statistically, and and so when something like that, even though it wasn't no social media, you know, it still had the internet back then, and and, and so I I was on my way to the Pro. If that wouldn't have happened, I was I was going to my fifth straight Pro Bowl for sure, and, and so you know, they say when you get five Pro Bowls, it's automatic Hall of Fame. I was. Uh, what was the reason? Just just because you flipped like yeah yeah. Like I think it's, it's like so many gotta, things other gotta, players have done and still made the Pro yeah, Bowl. Yeah, but you can't be a quarterback doing that. You can't be the face of the franchise, and you got to conduct yourself a certain way. And um, yeah, I just kind of let my emotions get the best of me, and a ridiculous moment, man. Oh. actually, there is a ridiculous moment that I saw, and it was actually your first NFL game, and. You were in the huddle with your team, and it was a TV timeout, and yeah. you reached inside your helmet and pulled out chapstick. <laughs> Started uh, like puffing your lips out there, and your teammates were like, yeah. "What? What is he doing?" And the next play, you took it to yeah. the twenty-five. And- yeah, um, I was just trying to loosen them up. I was just trying to lighten the mood. The, the huddle was the energy was like uh, kind of like it was down, and I just stepped out of the 
And I just put on some chapstick. And they like, yo, this dude just put some chapstick on. Yeah. He ain't played a down in the NFL. He just stepped out there. And like, yo, that was too cool. And I'm like, yeah, it's too cool. Let's go. Where'd you put it? Like, I remember. I had it like stashed. Like, like behind like, your like, ear? Yeah, in the middle of my helmet. I had a little oh. secret compartment back there. Where uh. I could, you know, we playing at Soldier Field and it get too cold. And my, and you can't be barking out cadence with chapped uh. lips. Man, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever worry about it like falling out mid game, or was it perfectly secured? I had replacements on the sideline. <laughs> I, I had replacements. I saw something that you spent you spent a thousand dollars a year on chapstick. Just about until oh. I, until we reached out to chapstick and tried to get an endorsement deal. They gave me a deal. They didn't give me no money, but they gave me a lifetime supply of chapstick at the time. <laughs> what gave what it brand? A lot of the way. What, was it Bird's Bees? Uh, or was that even a thing? Lip balm. What's the name of the chapstick brand? Chapstick. Oh, yeah, chapstick. chapstick, yeah, chapstick. Oh, is okay. it like a flavor or like? Yeah, this? um, yeah, I think it was the original. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, I think it was the original. I'm I hate super... the mint ones. The mint ones burn your lips. Yeah, I'll never, never, never do that. Yeah, I hate those. <laughs> I'm super blessed because I don't really get chat flips that much. You do, yeah. though. I have to like put it on like every two hours. Yeah, and me then too. this kid's like, yeah. I've never used chapstick a day in my life. Never. Yeah, I've never crazy. once used chapstick, which is bizarre to me. You're a lucky man. You're lucky man. Yeah. I'm Even just... when we lived in Colorado, like at altitude, it was so dry. Mm -hmm. I had to use them. Never. Yeah, you walk we were just outside there. or you get dry. Yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were just there two weeks ago and this dude did not put chapstick once. And I was uh, like, every 30 minutes because I, it was so dry. And my, li like, my lips are blistering, but I didn't feel any pain. Did y'all oh, ski? Well, Did y'all ski out there? Snowboard. Snowboard. Very, Voice crack. Very first time snowboarding. Yeah, I'm gonna learn to ski. I'm gonna learn this year. This you, no snowboard? Um, no, that sounds a little more dangerous. What's what's uh what's more dangerous? Skiing or snowboard? Mother, what's more dangerous? <laughs> it's, taking too, it's taking too long to answer that question. I'm gonna stick to skiing. Yeah, I, I think I think I think snowboarding is definitely well, snowboarding. Yeah, it's more tough because you have both feet strapped in. So if you fall, yeah. you just have your, either your arms embrace you. But yeah. like skis, you're kind of on a pole. So if you fall, you can just like and your feet yeah, and yeah. your feet pop out too. So like if you yeah, fall, yeah, it pops I'll, out. Yeah, I'll ski. I'll like ski. snowboard. I gotta show you a video after this. I I took a good spill. Check it out. Check it out. That was that was a ridiculous burn moment for Phoenix too. Yeah. Humbled him real fast on the snowboard. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was good, and, and we were filming a, a, a vlog during that, and I had the camera out, like, look at me, look at me, go, boom. Yeah, just well, <laughs> ate it. Good content. It was yeah, good, good I got the money content. shot. That's all I got. I got the money shot. I think we were done after that one. I was done. That was it. I called yeah, it a day. cool. <laughs> but, all right, moving on to the last letter, N. It's like two parts, now and next. So what are some burn moments uh, you're going through now? And what are some burn moments that you see coming to you in the future? Um, burn moments that I'm going through now. Um, you know, my kids are growing up, um, and uh, I feel like my wife and I feel like there's just a lot more teaching going on, um, a lot more monitoring. Um, you know, preparing for the future for them, and and you know their route to path to success. You know, we got an older son that's 20 in, in uh, New York Film Academy. He's aspiring to be an actor. And then we got, you know, our, our oldest daughter who's 18, um, who's high school quarterback for a flag football team. Oh. And so trying to figure out what direction she's going to go in in life. She's going to continue to play ball, go to college, you know, what's next for her. So those are like, um, you know, you know, burn moments that we going through right now. Feel like there's a lot of decisions, big moments that's that's pending and coming up, and and we gotta be a big part of that and helping them uh, make the right decisions. And so that's kind of in the now. What's next? Um, you know, we we trying to venture into the documentary space. We are uh, shooting a lot of content right now, and uh, hopefully um, trying to land a couple of nice deals with some of these major streaming service networks. So we got great ideas and. My wife and I, we're working on them together. Um, she just put a project together that's going to debut soon. The Evolution of the Black Quarterback is going to be um, an amazing story um, about the quarterback position and, and where we are now. And so really excited about that and continuing to, to be you know, the best analyst I could be at Fox and enjoying that and having fun. We just had the Super Bowl, and, mm -hmm. and the Super Bowl was amazing. Um, so we was able to broadcast that. So that's kind of like now and next for us, man. Cool. Speaking of the, speaking of the Super Bowl, your team, the Eagles, played. Did you go for them or were you? Really yeah, they, the they 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 almost pulled it off. But you know, I expect the Eagles to get back, and and so you, think? you know, yeah, absolutely, they'll get back. 
Um, the thing is, Kansas City is going to be good for a long time. Um, Andy has a formula now, and, and he got the best quarterback in the league. So, yeah. you know, when you got great head coach, great quarterback, you're going to win a lot of games. Oh, for mm -hmm. sure. For and sure. a healthy Patrick Mahomes, too. He was banged up. Man, he was banged up. He still played he through still it. Still played through it and won the Super Bowl. That tells you. I mean, look at that. Like, I just explained how hard it was to play in the NFL. And we got a guy who goes out there and win a Super Bowl on a hurt ankle. Like, yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Crazy you think, game. Easy. You think crazy that game. you think that last play was a PI? No. Yes. No. It, yes. The it was last a PI. Yeah, yeah, it was okay. a PI. You thought it was a PI. It was PI. Um he just got fooled. He just got tricked. He thought it was the same play that he had seen a couple plays before that. And and so, you know, in, in life you're allowed it you're allowed to make a couple mistakes. You own up to it. I like the way he owned up to it and you see what mm -hmm. happened. He mm -hmm. just got signed back to the Eagles. Yep. You know, so they didn't look at it as a as a major mistake. He, you know. Just do better next time. Mm -hmm. Spe uh, speaking of the documentary, when is that going to come out? Um, it'll be out in 2024 for sure. 24? It'll be out in 2024. Cool. We'll yeah. have to check that out. Yeah, yeah we'll definitely hard. have to check out. Let yeah, us know when it comes out. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. We should yeah. be one of the first premiere to watch it. No <laughs> doubt. Yeah, <laughs> and, and then y'all can talk about it on the platform. Yeah, we, man. Can do, of course. Of course. we can do a little recap show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'll so be cool. We do like little recap shows of like, like Super Bowl, uh, boxing, UFC, whatever. Oh, no, no, so we'll, we'll do a little recap on your documentary yeah, as well. Maximize the platform. Yes, sir. Maximize the yes, platform. Sir. Sure. Well, all right, Michael. You this just fun, felt man. burning your this life. Fun. Thank you. You are now the Burn on. Factory champion. I'm the champion. There you go. I'm but the let, let the audience know where they can find you, Instagram, um, wherever. You can find me uh, on Sundays during the season from September to January on Fox Sports. Um, shout out to Fox Sports. Um, on Instagram at Mike Vic. Twitter, I don't even know. I, I, I utilize my, my social media um, when needed, but, you know, continue to follow me. Follow my wife at, what's your Instagram, babe? <laughs> She's like, no. Yeah, she's like, no. She's like, Why are you always trying to play the background? <laughs> Every time someone's like, hey, you want to plug your stuff? I'm like, yep, it's Priest. <laughs> <laughs> always got to plug my stuff. Absolutely. But you heard Michael Vick. Go follow him. And as a gift for coming on the podcast, we will be you will be getting the Black Label Edition Burn Factory hoodie and yeah, hat. Yeah, baby. Yes, sir. Only, only, whoops. Uh-oh. I'm, <laughs> I'm fired. Only, yeah. uh, only guests can get those. Get okay, the Black cool, hoodie, cool. So. Yes, also the belt. So. And the belt. In the belt. In the belt. You're going home with the belt. I right, ain't got to work for it. Nice. <laughs> Appreciate it. Next time, you're on, next time you're on Fox, you just got to put that up right in front oh, of you. Oh, yeah. I won't forget, man. Remind me. Remind do me. I will. For sure. Well, that will do it. Michael Vick just spelled burn. Like always, please visit my foundation, the priestjamesfoundation.org. Again, the priestjamesfoundation.org to understand why this is called the Burn Factory. And we'll see you for the next episode. Peace.